Hello and welcome to Faith with Flavor. The average American household averages more than $7,000 in credit card debt. With staggering numbers such as these, it's important to bring our financial house back into order and find out why these numbers are the norm for American families. Helping us with that today is best-selling author Deborah Pagay, who wrote a book entitled 30 Days to Taming Your Finances. But first, take a look at how one ministry gives back to their community. Every day, a large percentage of the Los Angeles population struggle with the basic necessities to survive. Luckily, there is a ministry that is willing to extend out a helping hand to those in need. Parents stood in line alongside their children to receive some of the charity work being provided by Fred Jordan Mission. Some of the recipients had been waiting in line since the early morning hours. And how long have you been here? 3 a.m. 3 a.m. Yes. Wow. We have an, nothing, only an ice cream. Deborah, a single mother, expressed her gratitude for the Fred Jordan missions. We we don't have a job. You know, a lot of us don't have, not have a job, and we're struggling, and, you know, kids, they, they need shoes, you know, and we can't afford them. And it, it's just so wonderful that they help us out like this every year, you know. It's really a blessing. But the event didn't just bless mothers like Deborah. Many volunteers expressed how grateful they felt for being a part of this giving event. It's just wonderful to see kids look on their faces when they get like a new pair of shoes or a backpack or a haircut even. Like I had a couple kids that I just super excited about the haircut they got. Because I love so. God and I know this is what God would want us to do is, you know, help the community, is to be a, a servant. We're prepared to serve nearly 5,000 needy and impoverished children here in Los Angeles County. As the kids go through the line, they'll go through the alley, and we have over two dozen footlocker uh, associates there, and they're sizing the children. They'll go from there, and each child, boy and girl, of all ages, up to 21. They'll receive brand new school supplies, backpacks, and then they'll go further, and we have 100 Paul Mitchell associates for any of the kids that want to get their hair cut and styled. And then the best burger, bar none, not just in California and America, if not the world, truly in and out hamburger. And for one of the founders of the Fred Jordan Missions, servanthood is what it's all about. I want these precious moms and kids to know that they're special, they matter. They're the poor, the underclass. Most people never see them, certainly never hear their voice. I want to be the voice for them because today people are caring. If you just started tuning into Faith with Flavor, that was a brief look into the back to school annual event hosted by Fred Jordan Missions. Bless their hearts. Well, my very special guest today is best selling author Deborah Pagay. Thank you Good so to much see for being you, here with Donna. us. Good to see you so, again. Yes, yeah, so glad to have you here in the studio with us. You Thank know, you. you know, and I'm you're gonna bring so much knowledge to us today that I'm so looking forward to it. Well, hopefully. Yes. <laughs> and so for yeah. those who are not familiar with your background, can you give us a little background story on what you do? Well, I'm a CPA by training and, and education. I have an MBA in finance from the University of Southern California. Wow. And I quit my job uh, about eight years ago to go out and uh, speak and write full time. Mm -hmm. And I'm teaching people how to be empowered by managing their finances, uh, managing their relationships and, uh, and their emotions. Because believe it or not, they all tie in together. Yes, I yeah. believe it. Yeah. And when did you discover that you really wanted to help people financially? Well, my, I saw my mom who um, was so unempowered, I, I hate to use that word, but she had seven children and, and she had to tolerate an abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. And I thought she had no power. And I particularly started out wanting to get women to understand finances and to get in control of their finances and to position themselves so that they don't subject themselves to that kind of abuse. Now, I'm sure you went through it yourself, you know, in, in the financial world. What kind of mistakes did you make financially to help you realize what not to do? Well, I, I, I haven't made a ton, but I've made some. Okay, okay, so I did make some. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
think one of the things I learned to stop doing is to enabling people. I, again, I have a huge family, mm -hmm. and I found that uh, I felt guilty when they would come to me if I didn't uh, give them the temporary loans, which turned into permanent, you know, gifts. But I, so I found that that's not good. I even enable a few church people like that, making loans without having them to uh, sign a note, or it's just not good to make a personal loan anyway. So I think that was one of the things that I did that I shouldn't have done. And also consolidating debt when it wasn't completely necessary. It's just mm -hmm. kind of freed up more money now to spend on something else mm -hmm. <laughs> rather than concentrating on getting out of debt. I think sometimes we need to struggle with that a little bit. So those are a couple things I did. And what are some ways, Deborah, that we could make the most out of our earnings? You know, because a lot of people, they might not make a lot of money and they might think, listening to you saying, well, yeah, you know, easy for someone who makes a lot of money, say, but for me, on the other hand, I don't make that much. What would you tell someone like that? All the more reason to be intentional. And because the, see, there are two sides to the equation how much we make and how much we spend, and we can only control for the most part, well, we can control the, the earnings as well, but for the most part, you're only gonna control what you spend. So then you gotta look for ways to maximize your earnings. Maybe there's another revenue stream that you can pursue. God has given us talents and those kinds of things, but mm -hmm. I always tell everybody, see where you stand, because if when you look at your revenues and your expenses, you either need to make more money or spend less. I mean, this it's that simple. Yes. You gotta make more or spend less. And so when you look at the money and assess where you are, then you know whether or not, you know, okay, I make enough, I'm just spending too much, or maybe I need to make more, maybe I need to increase my skills, mm -hmm. my skill set, so that I have a, uh, I increase my ability to earn more money. You being a CPA, what would you say are some of the most um, biggest culprits in financial hardships? Well, just consumer debt. You mm -hmm. know, my, my dad died a few years ago, and he used to say that our yearnings are, exceed our earnings. And we live <laughs> in a consumer society. We know yes. that. You, you quoted the stats on how much people have in debt. Mm -hmm. But we really do like our stuff, and we want it now. It's mm -hmm. the now generation. Yeah, the and now so if generation. we don't stop and really, you know, be intentional, and I like that word. It's a buzzword in our culture, but we have to be intentional about the money. What do I want to do? And so how can we control that? Set a goal, because if you have a goal to say, okay, I want to know at any point in time I can live a month with, without, uh, if I have no money, if I have no money coming in. So that's a good goal. So no matter what that is, I have one month of living expenses stowed away. So see, that's, that's good. Mm -hmm. that, that's a goal. So if, if, and if, that hasn't, if you haven't achieved that, then that gives you something to work towards, which means you can't do everything else. You gotta mm -hmm. you know, get ready to achieve that goal. Now, credit cards are another you know, culprit in financial yeah, hardship. Yeah. How can somebody break the cycle of credit card debt? Well, you can understand how you got into the debt. Did you buy your needs or, or did you spend it on wants? And, mm -hmm. and you have to be honest with yourself. And it's the hardest thing sometimes to get real about debt. I had a friend many years ago who was in debt and she said when the bills would come, she would just throw them away. <laughs> she stopped paying them. <laughs> Lord yeah, have mercy. Because she didn't have enough money. So she said, I just, I just, I didn't open them. And then wow. there, you know, so and I taught a class not too, too long ago to a group of young ladies, and one of them said, well, you know, I don't pay my bill every month. I just wait and, and, until I have enough, and then I pay one big payment. It's like, no, mm. no, no. So manage that process. Man make sure you pay on time and always try to pay more than a minimum payment. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be important. It's, it's important, really, to try to avoid the debt. Listen, if you have to wait until you get your check to buy something, that means you can't afford it. <laughs> Ooh, that's good. Yeah. You're preaching yeah. it. <laughs> if, if you gotta wait till you get your check, it also means you don't need it. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, so if you want those new red shoes that only go in one outfit, you know, that's not smart. You know, that's yeah. not smart. But if you if you have to have that, wait till you can pay cash. Okay, Deborah, but how can we find balance? Because you you should understand this. Being a woman, you know, we like to look nice. We like to buy nice things. Where do we find the balance in all of this? Well, we find it internally because if we are if we are insecure, the more insecure we are, the more we spend. Mm. I, I like to say it this way: when you feel less than, you spend more than. <laughs> so you so just That's get real. Yeah. yeah. So this is what I like to ask people. Okay, if if everybody in the world were blind, would you buy that item? because that might mean you are buying it so somebody else can see you. So mm. just be real about that. I've, I've been through that cycle. I had a, a foreign car that was a convertible and classy and prestigious, and it stayed in the shop more than it stayed at my house. Wow. But I, I realized that my self-worth was tied to that car. So when, once I recognized that and said, you know, is this buying me something, or am I trying to give the impression that I'm really successful? Because to drive that car, you needed to be really successful. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, getting back to the credit cards. Yes. You know, a lot of times they lure you in by saying, you know, oh, you know, we're going to give you these points and, you know, the incentives yes. that, that come along with them. Are those are do or a don't? Depending on your personality. I love the incentives. I, I, we have a rewards card and we use it. We went to New York a few years ago, spent like four days, cost us just pennies because mm -hmm. we had built up the points. But if you're not disciplined enough to, to charge something and not pay it off when it comes, and I tell you, here's a good tip. If you want to use those cards, then really use them. You know, mm -hmm. use it and, and, and set, pay it immediately in your head or set it aside in your checkbook, and mm -hmm. then when the bill comes, pay it off. And I love it when you're buying something in some of the major department stores, and they'll say, if you get a card today, you can get 20% off. I say, great, so I'll, I'll do it. I don't keep opening new cards, but I'll use the card, get the 20% off, and I'll turn around at that same register with no shame and pay the bill off. May I pay on my bill now? <laughs> I, just, nice. I just got the discount, and I just mm -hmm. paid the bill. All in one fell swoop. Your FICA score must be amazing. Well, it's good. That. It's good, and you want to always be in that 700 club, I call it. Oh, the oh, 700 and nice. above. Okay. Yeah, so try to keep it there. And, and if it's not there, work on it. Because, see, it's not in cement. Mm -hmm. You can change that. You can change it by paying consistently on your bills and, and, and by not opening up a lot of credit. Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing. Now, you also wrote, wrote a book called 30 Days to Taming Your Finances. Yes. I have to ask, why did you pick 30 days? Why not 60 days or even 90 days or even a year? Well, because 30 days, according to most behaviorists, is, is, that's the length of time that it takes to establish a habit. So anything mm -hmm. you do for 30 days straight, you, you're mm -hmm. going to get into the mode. So that's why we use 30 days, because it's, it's that standard period of time to establish a habit. Now, one of the topics that you discuss in the book is spending smart. Okay. Let's dive into that for a little minute. How can we, the consumer, spend smart? Well, there's, there's smart debt and there's dumb debt. <laughs> okay, smart debt is the debt that's going to increase, that's going to bring value later. For instance, your education is a smart debt. And I, I'm sorry for everybody who has so much outstanding in student loans, Guilty. but you created an <laughs> asset. <laughs> yes. You created an asset. You are the asset that is now empowered to make more money. So that's mm -hmm. why they don't forgive those things. And, you know, you got to pay it off. So you just develop a, a, a strategy. But it's important that you do that. So that's smart debt. Now, um, buying a house is smart debt. Maybe it's going to increase in value. Maybe buying a painting, something that's going to increase in value. What's not smart? Consumer debt. Mm. Retail stores, eating out so much and charging it. You know, the food's long gone. You're still paying on it. Mm. <laughs> it's long gone. No more future be benefit to be had. So that's why you got to ask yourself, is it smart debt, dumb debt? Okay, another thing you talk about in your book is profiting from your passion, which actually was one of my favorite topics in the book. You have to get it. I read it myself, and honestly, you changed my life financially. Oh. You really did. So how can we profit from our passion? Let me tell you what I mean by that. God has given us gifts that we are passionate about. Mm -hmm. I'm passionate about writing. I'm passionate about speaking. That doesn't mean we got to do it for free. See, it's okay to do good, but you can also do well. And so, first of all, when you have a passion and you have a talent God has given you and you really want to maximize your potential in that area, you got to set yourself up so that people know that I'm, I'm in this for profit as well, which mm -hmm. means you need business cards, you need uh, rate sheets or whatever. You know, you have a rate. Don't let your friends come to you. For instance, I'll give you an example. So people will come to me and say, will you read my book for me? I've written a book. Can you read the manuscript? Well, that's time consuming. Yeah, so is. I have a rate for that. You know, it's three fifty an hour. <laughs> 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 so you don't have to use me though. So if I know the person really intended uh -huh. for me <laughs> to do it for free, you know, I'll just say, you know, there are people who do this for a living uh, and they will just, they're much ex less, they're much less expensive than I am. Oh. I would really recommend Susie to do that for you. Mm -hmm. See what that is saying is that I charge for this, mm -hmm. you see? And so because a lot of times we give away our time and we give it away and then we get really resentful about it. Now, the Bible talks a lot about giving. You know, it's yes. written all over the Bible. Yes. How um, do you incorporate giving into your finances? Oh, I love that question. Thank you for asking it, asking it because there are three levels of giving, tithes, offerings, and alms. Tithes, offerings, and alms. So the okay. tithe I owe, I give the 10% of my gross income to the church. I give over and above that to various ministries or special program at church. And then there's the alms, A-L-M-S, alms. Those are the good deeds I do for other people. And God says, when you consider the poor, mm -hmm. you are lending to the Lord. Isn't that mm -hmm. great? That's so awesome. I, you know, and some people may say, listen, I can hardly survive. I can't give tithes, offerings, and alms. 
do what you can. I believe you, tithe is, is commanded. I do for me personally and my husband and I have been married 36 years. We've never not paid our tithes. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I believe, we have never had to pay a bill late. We've never lost a car. We've never lost a house. Praise We've never God. lost anything. Praise God. You know, I want you to talk a little bit about that. You know, can you share a little testimony of, of a place where you saw God's hand move because of your faithfulness to tithing and giving? Absolutely. When I was 25 years old, I wanted to go back to school and get a master's degree from USC, no less. Very expensive school. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I started to plant seeds towards that. I would give uh, over and above and just say, God, I'm standing in faith that I'm going to get that fellowship because there was a program for minorities where they would uh, pay for the whole four years and give you a stipend in, 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 in addition to that. Well, I took the exam and didn't make enough. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I planted all the seeds. I told everybody, I even set a date. Well, they sent me a letter and say, sorry, we didn't, we didn't accept you. I said, mm -hmm. fine, I'll have to do this the hard way. Mm -hmm. So I went to Europe, spent all my money I had saved, came back, and, the, and there was a letter that says, we changed our minds. We're going to grant you the fellowship. Wow. <laughs> praise so God. So I got that uh, degree in seven months. Wow. Free. And there, I know people in my age range today, age range, who are still paying back. Wow. God school. is so good, he isn't is so he? so faithful. I could write 10 books on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, Deborah, another thing you taught me is how to manage people's self-imposed expectations. Oh, yeah. So right now, we're going to take a look at how we can also manage not only our finances, but also people's self-imposed expectations. Watch this video. Recently, TBN Salsa attended Friends Conference 2015, where we got to share with the public about the vision for this exciting new network. I really believe that God is going to use TBN Salsa for a revival that's going to take place right here in the U.S. So praise God for that. There, we also got to listen in on a meeting where best-selling author Deborah Pagay gives women helpful tips on managing expectations. They come from pretty much three areas. Those that you personally impose, those maybe the pastor imposes, and then the people will impose some pressures. One self-imposed expectation she mentions is being the hostess with no boundaries. People will respect you more if you have strong boundaries and you communicate those boundaries. Now you don't have to, you don't have to go around talking about what I don't do and this is what I do and this is what I don't do. There's a way to set boundaries and let me tell you, I set boundaries with everybody for everything. Perfection, claims Deborah, is another self-imposed expectation. When you try to be perfect, that's really a desire not to, to be blameless. It's a, it just, it's a desire to be blameless. I don't want anybody looking at me and criticizing me. Listen, criticism is not bad. Somebody just critiqued you and it's just their opinion. And when that criticism comes, she gave helpful tips on how to manage it. Let me tell you three ways to handle criticism. They all start with the letter L. Listen, look, and learn. Here we go. Listen. When somebody gets up enough nerve to tell you that they've observed some behavior or something that they think needs to be addressed, don't protest, don't interrupt, just listen. Because now you're establishing yourself as a person of humility and who's teachable, so you just listen. Now they may be as wrong as two left shoes, and that's fine, you just listen. You know, you don't say but or explain, and you say anything else, well thank you, thank you so much, and just listen. You know, you don't have to judge it, you just listen. And then you look for that element of truth, because in, in, in a lot of criticism, there's some little element, little kernel of truth. So look for that. It may not be all true, but when somebody's telling you about yourself, don't, don't go home and get all sulky. Just, you know, say, listen, you know, is that, maybe, maybe that's true. You look for the element of truth, and then you learn the lesson, and, you just, and you're done. We teach people how to treat us by what we tolerate. So when we cater to what they want us to do, we're teaching them that that's how to control my life. I'll just do what you tell me to do. She also interpreted what a woman of faith truly is. So you can't be a woman of faith who operates in fear. You can't be a woman of faith who operates in fear, fear of being rejected, fear that they're going to alienate me if they think I think I'm something, fear if I get too blessed, then people are not going to want to, you know, fear if I get a new car, they're going to say, oh, the pastor may have stolen some money. <laughs> you know, you just go through all kind of craziness. You see how you can deny yourself? because you won't manage those people's expectations. You can't, you, to see, you, you can only manage how you respond to them. So it's like, you know what, you don't have to get an attitude. You can just dismiss some things as, well, that's their opinion. You know, that's, that's fine, that's their opinion. Done, you're done with that. Walking in the destiny set before each person is the true depiction of living a life of faith. Pursue your passion. You gotta be that kind of person. Be the person that you wanna be because we reap what we sow. 
she made it clear that a woman of faith is not afraid to walk in God's divine destiny for her life. Don't let those kind of mindsets, I'm just talking about managing expectations, go on and pursue what you have to pursue and let God bless you all you can. If you just started tuning into Faith of Flavor, what you just saw was a little tidbit of a meeting held by Deborah Pagay, where she taught us how to manage people's expectations. Deborah, what you said, I love what you said there at the end about letting God just bless us all he can. Yes. Why do you think that some people really struggle with this? I think because we've been programmed to believe that Christians should be poor. It makes us more holy. But mm. God wants us to have the abundant life. And I know that we can, we can receive a blessing if we know we've been obedient. So we don't have to feel guilty because you see guilt comes out of having done something wrong. Mm. So I struggled with this for a while. Mm. I was afraid of success because I, didn't, I felt bad for everybody else maybe who hadn't achieved a certain level. So that's not my fault. I try to make myself available to help people, to inspire them encourage them, whatever. But it's not my fault if God wants to bless me. In fact, yes. it's, it's God honoring his word. So when I give, I expect to get. I don't give to get, but I give and expect. So when, when, I, when I'm blessed with abundance and I live in a wonderful house that overlooks the city of L.A., I used, I'm saying that because I used to, I used to would not say that. It's like, mm -hmm. But I prayed for that for a long time. I wanted that environment, and God has blessed me to have it. And listen, we have sacrificed for the work of the Lord. So it's not like I deserve it, but God is honoring his word. Give and it shall be given unto you. Amen. Yes. How, Deborah, how can we get to that place of just being able to receive God's blessing, His goodness in our lives? Well, by taking back your power from whoever this almighty they are that you're afraid would judge you. And so you just be, know that you've been obedient and make sure you're always walking in integrity. You're mm -hmm. integrating God's principles with everything you do in your life. And then you just receive. You just receive and know why you're receiving. Be a channel of blessings. Don't be a reservoir. Mm -hmm. Don't let God just bless you, bless you, bless you, and you say thank you, thank you, thank you, and you never pass it on. I believe God wants to channel our blessings through us. Someone once said if he can get it uh, through you, he'll get it to you. Amen. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about your upbringing. You're a strong, very strong, powerful woman of God with so much knowledge and influence. How did you grow up? Like, what was your upbringing like? My, my dad was very budget conscious, and I'm glad for it. Now, at the time, I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> didn't like it, but my, my dad was very, very budget conscious. So when I went away to college, he only sent me $10 a month for four years. Wow. Well, I learned to budget my money. My budget for Sunday dinner was a dollar. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> it was. But, you know, I look back on that and I'm, I'm thinking, we all need that kind of discipline. I've seen people who suffer because their parents gave them everything. And then when the hard times hit, they didn't know how to, how to adjust. I always say you can live off of less. So, I, I know, as Paul said, I know how to be a base and I know how to abound. I don't, wherever I am, I can always figure out that I can live off of less if I have to. And I try to make sure I'm, I'm always interacting with people who have less and those who have more so that I don't lose the touch. So, were you raised in a Christian home? It was Christian, but it was had a lot of dysfunction. Let's just <laughs> let's just say that my dad was over the church money, mm -hmm. and uh, and and was very integral. That's what I liked about him. But he was budget conscious and integral. So I was raised in a Christian home. Now, getting back to your book, you know, which I urge you to go get that book. You're not going to regret it. But getting back to the book, what did you want your audience to receive from this book? Well, two things. I wrote it for singles and married people, and just people in general. There are only two categories. <laughs> but I wanted the single people to really understand how that is important, even before you get married, that your house is in order. A, a lot mm -hmm. of women are, you know, they meet a, a great guy, but he doesn't want to marry a woman with a lot of debt. But I also wanted singles to know how to look for financial red flags in the, in the person that they're going to marry. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in my book, I have a 2020 vision checklist. 20 questions that you compare notes will let you know whether or not this person is not good for uh, handling finances. Mm -hmm. And then I want married couples to understand that two cannot walk together unless they're in agreement on the finances especially. And so I, get, I give tips on how to come together and, and my husband and I do seminars and that kind of thing. So I wanted people to understand that, that it's important just to, you know, let God be the drum major in your finances. Now getting back to your husband, how yeah. do you guys work it out, you know, as far as financially? How do you balance each other out in that area? Well, and you know, God has a sense of humor. So there's <laughs> one who's an extreme saver and one who likes to uh, enjoy life. And so I think we represent that. I'm an extreme saver. You know, I, want, I, don't, I don't want one month's operating expenses. I want like two years. <laughs> <laughs> And then wow. he says, you know, and if we die, who's going to get it? You know, that kind of thing. So we, we balance each other out. And here's the important thing. We believe that whatever comes into the household in terms of finances belongs to the marriage. So we really don't have that's mine, that's yours. We may have separate accounts, which he, 
he handles all of them, but, you know, I may have an account that I can, and, and I do, that I write from. And so it's just an open book. We don't have secrets and secret codes, and I don't have a little stash just in case he leaves me and I'll be... <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's just craziness. The struggle is real, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. Because I know a lot of people have been taught that, you know, have your little stash because you never know what this man's going to do. Mm. Well, you know, I believe God. Amen. I believe God. And you believe in marriage and the I fact do. that, you know, when what God has joined together, no man can put under. That's right. 36 yeah. years happily married. How about Praise that? God for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Deborah, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to look into that camera right there. And maybe there's somebody watching who is struggling in the area of finances. And maybe what you said is really resonating in their hearts because they want to be that woman, the Proverbs 31 woman that manages her, her finances well, that does a good job. And, and maybe it's a man, you know, who's struggling in the yes. area. Maybe he has a lot of debt and he doesn't want to live with that debt any longer. Would you just look into that camera and encourage them right now? I say if you are struggling with finances today, first of all, understand that that's not God's will for you to struggle. I would do two things. Inwardly, I would ask myself, now have I opened this door in any way for Satan to come in and thwart the, my blessings. So I would check my integrity. I, I've had situations where I had to stop and say, did I open this door for lack? So you wanna make sure that you're always doing the right thing, not lying on your taxes, not lying on your car insurance and that sort of thing. But secondly, I would look outwardly because this is very important. Look outwardly, who can I get to help me? Don't struggle in secret. Too many people struggle in secret. I was reading the story the other night of the woman that God uh, told her, that Elisha told her, listen, if you're struggling, while you're struggling, go and ask all your neighbors to lend you some pots. And I'm thinking, all the neighbors got? I would have said, now they're going to know my business. So here's the point. Let people know that you have a need. That's why it's important to belong to a spiritual family, a church family, people who know you and, and know your situation. And then also get out there and network. Listen, God uses people. You don't put your faith in the people, but God uses people. So let people know that there is a need. And watch how you talk about your lack. Don't talk about it because there's nothing like facts to sabotage your faith. So don't talk about it. Just declare the word of God. Tell yourself all day long, my God shall supply all my need according to his great resources. Amen. I received that. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you so much. Thank you. If someone would like more information on your ministry, where can they go? They can go to my website, confrontingissues.com, and we deal with relational freedom, financial freedom, and even emotional freedom. Well, that is all the time we have. Deborah. thank you so much thank for you, being Donna. here with us. You were amazing. Oh, and thank so you at home for watching Faith with Flavor. God bless you. I love you. Bye-bye.